which is titled Uniform Use of Carts and Works, Maintenance Update, How to Improve Your Revenue Cycle Management. We're very happy to have presenters from United Healthcare here today. Today, uh, we will have CAQH Corp staff describe the Uniform Use of Carts and Works rule and the CAQH Core Code Combination Maintenance Update, as well as the CAQH Core Code Combination Test Group Maintenance Review. Then we will have Lynn Franco from United Healthcare talk about the role of the core code combination task group in her capacity as co-chair of the task group. Um, and then we will have Lynn as well as Melody Smith from United Healthcare talk about their experience as implementers of this process and their lessons learned and best practices. Finally, we'll have some time to take your questions. But before we get into today's session, CAQH Core Senior Project Associate Tyler Schultz will share some webinar logistics. Thank you, Jessica. Um, just so before be before we begin today, uh, just a few things to uh, to note for you. One, you can download a copy of today's presentation from the caqh.org website. To do so, you navigate to the core page, and under the education events, you'll see the event at of, of today, and you can actually download the presentation entitled "Presentation Slides." It'll be a PDF document for you. On the slide, you'll also see a screenshot of the attendee GoToWebinar dashboard. You should see something that looks similar to this on the right side of your computer desktop. When joining today's session, it's possible that you may have joined the audio portion of the webinar using your computer speakers by default. If possible, we would prefer you to join the webinar audio by telephone. To do this, please select the telephone radio button in the audio panel of your dashboard, and the dial-in information will be displayed. Make sure you enter your audio pin, which is found under your dial-in information. Time at the end of today's program will be dedicated to responding to audience questions. You are encouraged to submit your questions at any time during this webinar by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. We do ask that when you submit your question, you identify the type of organization you are with so we can give you a more accurate response. But if we have time at the end of today's session, we will also be taking audio questions from the audience over the telephone at the end of the session. When we begin the audio portion of the Q&A session, you may raise your hand using the hand raise tool found here on the webinar dashboard. When it is your turn to ask a question, we will unmute your line, announce you, and you can begin. Please hold off on using the hand raise tool until prompted to do so, as we will be putting all hands down at the beginning of audio Q&A. Once again, in order for your line to be unmuted, you must enter your audio pin on your telephone keyboard. Now back to Jessica for us for the rest of our session. Thank you, Tyler. So let's start out today's session with an introduction to uniform use of Carts and Rocks rule and the CAQH core, co core combination maintenance update, as well as the CAQH core, core combination test group maintenance review. And here to speak on this is Core Senior Manager Bob Bowman. Bob? Great. Thank you, Jessica. Um, and as you can see, and as Jessica mentioned, uh, we do want to level set really with what the rule requires. And the rule does require a few things. Um, but before the rule even um, came into inception, the, the kind of the, the lay of the land when it came to providers receiving remittance advice and the information contained in those remittance advice for the 835s was really um, troublesome for providers to say it, uh, to say it mildly. That's because before the rule, there were um, 360 CARCs, 910 RARCs, four group codes resulting in um, hundreds of thousands, potentially, code combinations that providers would have to um, evaluate as they reviewed the remittance advice data um, to see how a particular health plan had um, adjudicated that claim. How do they pay or deny a particular line item or a claim itself? Um, with the core rule, um, we define, taking the kind of 80-20 approach, that um, looking at where were the biggest problems at, and those problems we defined really in um, in, in hoping to resolve through four business scenarios. So the business scenarios are specific to um, data that's missing, incomplete, or invalid um, coming in on the claim itself or from documentation or attachments on the claim, um, types of services that were billed by the provider that are either covered or not covered, as well as um, services that are separately payable or not. So looking at that, again, that 80-20 approach, the core rules um, define four business scenarios that are specific to these types of scenarios that a plan would use to adjudicate a claim and trying to resolve the um, clean or unclean claims uh, problems that providers have and health plans have in receiving those types of claims. So with that as our level set, I'd like to hand the call over to Omni um, Adekambi. 
uh, for to talk through the next uh, the next section of our slides. All right, thank you, Bob. Um, so the next slide outlines the code, core code combinations maintenance process. Um, as you can see, the core code combinations are maintained by a task group that conducts two types of reviews, compliance-based and market-based reviews. Compliance-based reviews occur three times a year and are in response to publication of the updated CARC and RARC list maintained by the code committee authors. So at each three times a year in um, March, July, and November, the code authors agree to either activations, additions, excuse me, deactivations and removals from the CARC and RARC list, which CAQH Corp then considers for impact on the published code combination. Once a year, we also do a market-based review or an MBR, and this occurs in response to industry-driven feedback. So over a period of about 60 days, um, CORC co collects via an industry survey submissions for potential adjustments to the color code combinations to meet ongoing and evolving industry business needs. And these submissions are considered concurrent with one of the existing CBRs, so that we have just three publications a year. And then any adjustments approved by the task group are published along with some, the CBR adjustments um, in one of the core code combinations. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll see a little bit more information about the core code combinations task group. So as I uh, mentioned, the core code combinations task group is responsible for the ongoing maintenance of the core code combinations. And this group is composed of other 50 core participating organizations representing a wide variety of stakeholders and is led by four multi-stakeholder co-chairs. Shannon Baber from UW Medicine, J Janice Cunningham from Relay Health, Lynn Franco from United Health Group, who is here with us today, and Heather Morgan from Aetna. And again, as I mentioned, the task group conducts two types of reviews via the core code combinations maintenance process, compliance-based reviews, CBRs, or market-based reviews, and market-based reviews of MBRs. And most recently, in June of this year, on June 1st, the task group completed a concurrent com compliance-based and market-based review. And the CBR focused on adjustments in response to the updated code list published on Mark 1st, the updated CARC and Mark list. And then the MBR focused on adjustments to the existing core-defined business scenarios that were received via an industry survey that was collected from um, the end of last year through the January of this year. And then the task group approved adjustments for both the CBR and MBR are included in the current version of the core code combination, the core code combinations version for 3.2.0, June 2015, which is published again on June 5th. Moving on to slide 8. So as we've outlined here, the task group's maintenance efforts are year-round. There's always plenty of opportunity to get involved and contribute to the task group's work. Slide 8 outlines the upcoming task group activities through the rest of 2015. So currently the task group is completing a compliance-based review in response to the updated CARC and RARC list published on July 1st. And then the updated version of the core code combinations with any task group approved compliance-based adjustments will be published on October 1st. Also in quarter 4, we will be launching the 2015 industry-wide survey to collect the industry suggestions on potential adjustments to the code combination. And then the task group will conduct its third CBR of the year. And again, the bottom of the slide eight outlines lost opportunities to get involved with the core code combinations. So if you are a core participating organization, um, a link to which is available in the deck, you, all core participating entities are eligible to participate in the task group. You can just contact core at cqh.org to um, join the task group and attend its meet, its meetings and contribute to the discussion. If you're not a core participating organization, we are happy to help you with that also. And um, there's an application form that you fill out, and it's a rather seamless process that we can definitely give you more information about. So please feel, feel free to contact core at cqh.org for that also. And then also keep an eye out for the upcoming 2015 industry survey, uh, more details with, of which will be distributed widely to the industry um, later in quarter four of this year. So slide nine provides a summary of the adjustments included in the June 2015 core code combination, the current version that was just published. Overall, between the code list updates and the industry submissions received, the task group considered over 400 potential individual adjustments. 
And then through extensive polling and discussion to reach consensus, the task group agreed to a set of adjustments to the core code combinations, including, as you can see, the addition of 232 new code combinations and the removal of 102 existing code combinations. And then moving forward, the next couple slides provide some examples of the additions and removals and relocations that the task group approved as part of this recent concurrent CBR and MDR work. And this is just really to give you a flavor of what type of changes that the um, task group is looking at and making when they are especially streamlining and improving the core code combination. So as I've shown on the table on slide 10, each adjustment has a specific rationale for its application and expected benefit in improving the claims resolution effort by both the provider and the payer. So for example, as I've shown on slide 10, the task group approves the addition of work M20, the description of which is missing incomplete or invalid tick ticks, to CARC 4, the description of which, which is the procedure code is inconsistent with the modifier or required modifier is missing. And so the idea of pairing this work with this CARC is that as the work identifies that the inconsistency specified by CARC 4 is due to the HIC 6 code, then the CARC 4 and work M20 code combination ideally eliminates the need for the provider to follow up with the health plan to determine what specific information is needed. So what ex exact procedure co um, code is inconsistent and what information needs to be addressed that is referred to by CARC 4. Similarly on slide 11, slide 11 identifies some sample code combinations that the task group agrees to either remove from the core code combos or to relocate from one business scenario to another. And as shown, the drivers for these adjustments were to address inconsistencies between the CARC and the RARC or between the RARC and the description of the business scenario. So for example, the task group agreed to remove RARC MA67 from CARC 96 because the RARC addresses a billing error while the business scenario number three addresses a, deni a claim denial because the billed service is not covered by the health plan. So the rationale for removing that code then was that the RARC does not meet the description of the scenario. And the expected benefit is that this will reduce the manual provider follow-up needed to address the consistency between the RARC and the business scenario. So as shown from these two example slides, in addition to ensuring the code combinations fully address ongoing business needs that fall within the four core defined business scenarios, the goal of the industry-driven adjustments is to ensure that the code combinations are clean and more consistently and accurately address business needs. So finally, this slide 12 provides um, the compliance date for the current code combinations and some available resources to assist with implementation. So as shown, the date by which HIPAA covered entities must update their systems to comply with the June 2015 core code combinations is September 5th of this year. So HIPAA covered entities always have 90 days from the date of publication of an updated version of the core code combination until compliance with that version is required. As you'll see at the bottom of the slide, the core website has uh, many resources to assist with implementation, including we have a dedicated web page that focuses just on providing information and guidance on the core code combinations and the 360 rule. And we encourage you to visit that page to view a host of resources to assist with implementation, as well as we have detailed information each time we publish a new version of the code combinations on the changes made and um, the scope of them, et cetera. So that's really a great resource for you. And of course, you can always contact for cch.org. So now I think I'd like to hand it back to Tyler for our first polling question of the session. Tyler? Thank you very much, Omni. Uh, to begin, we'll be doing two polling questions this afternoon. In this first polling question, we ask, do you have a process in place to adjust internal CARC RARCs based on the updated code list, uh, code lists published three times a year? I'm going to now launch the poll. I'll give you about 30 to 40 seconds to answer. And once we finish, I'll go ahead and share those results with you. So we'll go ahead and begin now.
All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds to participate. Thanks very much. If everybody's participated, we're going to go ahead and close it now and share those results with you. As we can see here, a majority of you do say yes, and you do have a process in place to adjust some of these internal CARC-RARX codes based on the updated code list. Um, we certainly appreciate your participation. This is invaluable information for us to use moving forward as this process, as Ami mentioned, will happen three times a year with the CBR and once per year with the MBR. With that, I'll go ahead and pass it right back over to Jessica for us to continue on with our session. Jessica. Thanks so much, Tyler. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Lynn Franco, who's a business process manager with United Healthcare and has been with the company for 27 years. And I would also like to welcome Melody Smith, who is also a business process manager with United Healthcare and has been with the company for 28 years. Thank you both for being with us today. Lynn? Thank you. So I'm here today to present a little bit of information about what it is to be a on the task group as a co-chair, as well as um, some of the implementations and, and how we at United Healthcare have gone about implementing the um, Kirk and Mark usage. You can move ahead. Thank you. So on this slide is just a, a, a quick overview of the many different um, business segments we have within United Healthcare and Optum. We have our community and state. We have our employer and individual, our Medicare and retirement, as well as our mi military and veterans divisions. We have over 35 million Americans at every stage of life within these different um, business segments. And um, within Optum, we also have our Optum Insight, our Optum Health, as well as Optum Rx. So as far as United Healthcare goes, our CAQH core involvement has been we are a Phase 1 and Phase 2, a 5010 core certified health plan, and we are currently um, pursuing Phase 3 as well. We are um, a core board member, and as well as myself being a current co-chair on the CAQH core code combinations task group, and I am with the United Healthcare Division. In the past, we had a CH CAQH board chair of David, David Wickham. He was an executive VP with United Health Group and the president of United Health Group Operations and Technology. And United Health Group is an active cl collaborator on industry initiatives that simplify healthcare administration for health plans, providers, resulting in better care experiences for both our patients and our caregivers. So as part of the CAQH core task group co-chair, this is somewhat of a new role for me. I transitioned into this role in um, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, and um, our faces are probably most out there as leading and presenting the task group calls that are held on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. But within that, we are responsible um, for the maintenance to ensure uniform use of the CARCs and RARCs um, to, support, to support stability and ongoing improvement of the core code combinations. And that's done, which we've already spoken about a little bit, um, but it's done through the market-based reviews, the MBRs, which are held once a year via teleconference and online surveys. It allows for industry submissions for adjustments to the core code combinations based on business needs, the addition, removal of code combinations, as well as any potential new business scenarios. And it's an opportunity to refine the core code combinations as necessary to ensure they reflect industry usage and evolve as evolving business needs. And then we have the compliance-based reviews, the CBRs, which are held three times a year, and they support the ongoing improvement of the core code combinations. And they include only adjustments to code combinations to align with the published code list updates, so the additions, modifications, and deactivations. And our next slide is going to be presented by um, my peer, Melody Smith. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. 
So at United Healthcare, this slide tells us a little bit about our transaction service profile. Our operational objective is to collaborate with our provider network, transition phone calls, paper claims, to electronic transactions, and transition batch adjudication to more real time. So we have more than 20 million benefit eligibility and claim status calls annually. We process more than 411 million claims processed annually. Um, under eligibility and benefits, we support eligibility transactions, both real-time and batch. Um, and we support more than 264 million EDI transactions annually. And 95% of those are handled in real-time. For claim status, we support claim status transactions, both real-time and batch also. And we handle more than 54 million EDI transactions annually. 835, 97% of the claims on our two major claim processing platforms will result in an 835 transaction. Next slide, please. This slide 19 gives a high level view, and I, I imagine um, a lot of the other payers that are on the phone have something pretty similar. But the way the transaction flows at a, at a high level is we have data that comes in from our trading partners, either from um, LabCorp, which is naturally one of our largest labs. They come from providers. They come from clearinghouses. They enter through either through a direct connect method, through some sort of connectivity director, or through a clearinghouse of some, some means. And then once we get it into the system within UHC, then it will need to go through um, either through a business-to-business -business type environment or a gateway. And both of those will then enter through what we call, you'll see abbreviated there as UFI, which stands for United Front End. And United Front End does our routing to our various claim engines. Next slide, please. Um, under our code combination, planning, analysis, and maintenance, so we talked earlier about the different phases of CAQH, also receiving the WPC uh, three times a year updates also. Um, there's basically three phases. We have our planning phase, which we began analysis back in 2013 um, with our first core 360 mapping publications. And we needed, we immediately recognized we needed to set up some sort of process to maintain this growing list of, of CARCS and RARC codes. So we identified what type of resources we would need to review those publications that come out both from CORE as well as the WPC sites. Um, we identified and created education for understanding of the requirements. And what that meant is they were really new to us but we needed to make sure that we understood what the intent of those requirements for each of those business scenarios were. Um, we reviewed our 835 code mapping on each of our platforms. We began our alignment of resources. We reviewed um, each of our current processes and conducted gap, gap analysis. We needed to find out which codes of ours did we need to work on remapping which of our codes we needed to loop in different business partners and make sure that they understood the changes. Um, so we identified and implemented business process changes and identified and implemented enhancements designed to remove hard coding in our system. And what I mean whenever I use the word hard coding is over the years with our system platforms, there was logic built in the system, for example, to say if you're going to report a deductible, report it with reason code or CARC reason code one. Well, we need to make that more of a business maintainable table and get away from that hard coding so that we could be more fluid with the publications that came out and be able to quickly implement changes. So under UHC maintenance, we have we now have what I feel comfortable saying is that a, a nice orderly process. We receive our core code combinations three times a year. We get our surveys, we get um, our WC updates, and as soon as we get those, we start working on them. Uh, we added business table flexibility 
to help with our mapping. And what that means is that um, now if we need to make a change and have it be available for us within the next 90 days, we can go change it on a table rather than having to implement and pay for a costly system enhancement to make changes to our CARC and RARC mappings. And then we also created some tools to simplify how we determine which, one of, which of our codes need to be updated. And next page. So I think this slide 21 just talks about a little bit more at a high level. Um, we have multiple claim processing platforms within United Healthcare. Um, we needed to create a consistent process where we would make sure that um, as these publications come out that we could update the mapping on all of them. Um, we technically think of it as six publications. We know we get three publications from CAQH and we get three publications from WPC um, and both of them have to be implemented. And we created internal work groups that we share this information with and that we meet with to make sure we agree on how certain codes should be mapped or what needs to be changed on our mappings. And the chart in blue and gray just tells you the time periods that we expect somewhere around February, June, and October. We know to be watching for the CAQH publications. In March, July, and November, we are looking for the WPC. And when we get the, the publications, we actually start working on those that week. Um, we don't wait till we get closer to that 90-day time frame. Uh, we need all the lead time that we get whenever we get these to go through our mappings and make sure um, that all of our business units agree with the changes that our team is going to make to, to bring us to match the CAQH list. And next page. All right, and going back to just some of our best practices, um, as Mel indicated, we did create um, business tables for these updates to be done without a system release or IT involvement. What that um, allows for us now is to have same-day update capability. Uh, it allows for immediate corrections if errors happen to be found. And it allows for the ability to instantly address any provider complaints um, if an issue is received. Um, in the past, when we had to go through, you know, IT, we would have to wait um, until, you know, they did their testing and the system was enhancement and, you know, our set release time. So by having these business tables, we can do everything quickly, um, less expensive, and um, within our own teams. So we removed the hard coding logic and the system logic um, that would automatically apply certain CARC codes. We now have an intake, um, and our responses are all housed in one location. And we are currently piloting an access database to help us create report mapping to extract and identify the updates required. Next slide, please. So some of our lessons learned, the benefits from this process has been it promotes consistency, consistency in reporting to providers, um, reduction in administrative costs for posting. We've removed variability from payer to payer for the providers and UHC, and our internal areas are welcoming guidance for usage. Some of the challenges have been you know, mapping the UHC business product needs with the core 360 mapping rules. Um, the time challenges required for updates and surveys, re-educating our internal business partners on new mapping expectations and requirements, as well as the additional staffing time that it takes us now. And next slide. So how can you become involved? Um, you can join the CAQH Corps to, to directly contribute. Um, most effective way for individual organizations to ensure they have direct input on the operating rules is to become a core participating organization. You participate on subgroups, work groups, rules, writing calls, surveys, draw polls, and ballots, as well as being eligible to be a co-chair. Your entity vote on CAQH core operating rules at work group and full car participating organization voting levels. And you access to CAQH core education sessions session specific to core participating organizations. 
In addition, you can submit market-based adjustments to the core code combinations through the online submission form. You can complete CAQH core industry surveys host educational sessions within your organization or system, as well as attend CAQH core education sessions. Next slide. I think this is where I take over, Lynn and Melody. Thank you so much for your, uh, your presentation this afternoon. Um, really yeah, thank for you. Us. Very interesting to see your aspects and your side of it, so thank you. Um, once again, folks, we're going to do our second and final polling question today. We ask, which benefits of implementation of the CAQH core code combinations has your organization experienced? Please check all that apply. I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. Once again, we'll give you 30 to 40 seconds to uh, complete the poll. And then once we close it, I'll go ahead and share the results. So we'll go ahead and begin now. All right, we'll give it about 10 more seconds, everybody, to complete the poll. Thank you very much to everybody who participated. We're going to go ahead and close it now. Go ahead and share those results with you. Kind of a mixed review or, or, or mixed bag here. We did see that a majority of you did select that it does promote consistency in reporting to providers, which we're glad to see. But again, thank you so much for giving us this information. It's very helpful for us moving forward. Um, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and hide those results once again. And uh, I'll pass it back to my colleague, Jessica Porras, Senior Manager. Jessica. Thanks so much. And now we have some time for Q&As. Um, let me uh, refresh uh, what Tyler mentioned to you earlier. Uh, to submit your questions, please type them into the questions panel on your dashboard. And, and again, please identify your organization so we can answer your question correctly to your particular uh, stakeholder. Um, also, um, if we have time, we will take some audio questions from the audience. So you can raise your hand using the hand raise tool on the webinar dashboard. And when it's your turn to ask a question, we'll unmute your line and you can begin. And once again, in order for your line to be unmuted, you would have to have entered your audio PIN number on your telephone keyboard when you first called into the webinar. Um, so let's start the Q&A portion. We've got a couple questions already. Um, so here is the first question. It looks like it's coming from a provider. The question is, we have a code combination we receive frequently that's not in the core code combination. How can we get this combination included? Uh, Bob or Omni, would you like to take this question? Sure. Um, thanks, Jessica. That's a great question. So that would actually be submitted to CAQH Core as part of the industry-driven market-based review process. So again, as a task group does two types of reviews for the maintenance process of the code combinations, compliance-based and market-based. And our market base is where we respond to the industry-driven requests for changes, and those are collected once a year. So later this um, fall, um, in, later in quarter four of this year, we will have another industry-wide survey that will be distributed and opened, and we will be collecting submissions from the industry. And so we encourage everyone who has any changes to the core code combinations that they um, would like added, for example, a code combination they would see frequently um, that should be in the business scenarios to submit that via the industry survey during that time. And again, we'll be distributing um, lots of notices and notifications about that industry survey period. Thank you so much, Omni. Um, we have another question, um, which is, um, when will the next updated version of the core combinations be published, and by what date must entities be in compliance with the changes? Omni or Bob, would you like to take that question? Um, yeah, I'll jump in and take that one. Um, we're currently actually going through our next CVR compliance-based review, and actually that survey is, is open still. So um, uh, we're receiving feedback from the industry on those codes that were added, modified, 
um, as well as removed from the latest uh, code set. Um, and once we do have, once we finalize that compliance-based review, which those codes were uh, just published um, uh, July 1st, uh, we should be publishing our updated version in, by October 1st, with a compliance date of January 1st of 2016. So you can see that physical process with our compliance-based reviews. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, I think we have some questions um, that might be for the UHC part of the presentation. Let me see. One of the questions is, um, how do you ensure your business partners are aware of these continuous changes to the CARC and RARC codes? I'm not sure, um, since it's talking about business partners. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Melody. I'll actually um, fill that one for UHC. Uh, we actually do publications even within house. So once we get the notification from CAQH, of the either the surveys or um, the compliance reviews that are coming out, we disseminate those to our business partners in-house. I know a lot of them might be participants on the CAQH group also, but we have a large distribution that we share those with in-house to let them know what changes we're making. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have another question for CORE here. The question is, will additional scenarios be defined in the future? I can take that, Jessica. Thank you. So that's a great question. We actually, as part of the market-based reviews, we look at both edits to the code combinations in the existing scenarios and potential additional new scenarios that kind of have an industry business case or um, high usage to address that AB20 problem. So as part of the survey that was conducted in 2014, um, expected from end of November to early January this year, we did collect um, just a small handful of about um, five potential new scenarios um, with varying business cases. And we, there currently are plans in process at CORE for the TAP group to review those new scenarios and determine if um, any of those should be added to the to the CAQH CORE 360 um, rule set. So stay tuned for that. But yes, yeah, so the, the answer in some is yes, there is a potential for new scenarios to be considered. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, is the code combination list free for code mem core members? Um, I'll take this question. And the core code combinations that we include on our website are free to anybody. So you don't even have to be a core member. Um, they're, at, they're free as long as all of our rules are all free and available on our website. And as a note, um, the code committees do publish their codes on the WPC website as well. So the code sets themselves are available and the uh, core code combinations are available on our website. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, is there any other for format available other than the Excel spreadsheet that can be provided of the CARC RARC combinations? So um, currently the core code combinations are published in the one document, the Excel workbook that is available, as Bob mentioned, to the entire industry. Um, we do, you know, collect suggestions for or looking for new implementation tools um, for all of the operating rules to make them more user friendly and, and what have you. So, if there is some other potential format we can consider, you know, feel free to email core at cqh.org. But currently, that workbook is where all of the core code combinations are published. Um, the next question, I think, is for Lynn. Um, the question is, do you have staff solely dedicated to this work, and it's uh, specific to UHC? We do not. Um, we have a few individuals who have the responsibility for these updates. Um, it is not their um, only role within the company. Um, probably if we combined it and had a single person doing all of it, it would be, but we do have it broken out into separate individuals because we do have several platforms within our organization and they are each specialized within their own platform, so um, we have it currently broken out like that. But they do work together, um, you know, within the team, they communicate together um, and, you know, they make sure everything is in sync together between the apps the applications and when updates are being done. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, 
if a health plan is using rock codes with group codes and no CARC, how do we request assistance to get the payer to resolve this? Um, this is Bob Bowman. I'll take the question. I think that uh, this is definitely a challenge that providers have, have mentioned um, to us in the past and, and part of other challenges with um, health plans using the codes uh, that may not be part of the core code combination. So this is maybe more of a really not that we can address, but we can provide some guidance um, just because of the experience that we've had with these types of questions from providers in the past and, and working with health plans, providers, and clearinghouses and, and your software vendors that all use these codes. Um, so one thing that providers can do, um, you do need to work closely with your health plans um, if there is some sort of issue with their um, code combination. And usually that means um, addressing, uh, you know, calling them up and working with them to get those CARCs and RARCs and group codes so that the providers can understand them. Now, hopefully we're taking the first step here with the first four, four uh, defined business scenarios and making them consistent across the industry. Um, but when providers do run into those problems with specific code combinations or um, a lack of, uh, perhaps even of understanding how the codes uh, should be or could be used within the transaction itself, um, providers can address those questions directly to the health plan as well as uh, work with X12 because X12 can help uh, address specific questions about usage of the transaction themselves. So uh, we do all kind of want to work together, um, but we do, do know there are some, uh, very specific challenges with the code uh, combinations that may not be part of the core code combinations just yet. Thank you so much, Bob. And I just want to remind um, all the attendees that if you have questions, uh, please submit them now. Um, I have one question that I think is a formality in UHC. The question is, in one of the slides, you talk about the mapping after every CARC-RARC publication. How time intensive is it to update the mapping six times a year? Uh, this, hi, this is Melody. Actually, that is a really good question. We don't track the hours that we're spending on it because each publication could have a significant number of changes, whereas the next one may have a, a lot fewer changes. Um, but one thing I do want to share with the group, we're actually in the process of piloting and working on an access database where we can upload if you will, to access these changes from the publications. And hopefully it will spit us back a report that will quickly tell us you need to make XX changes and here's the codes that you need to change. Just by simply um, recognizing the, the codes that are on the publication with what we have mapped on our major platforms, it could give us a, a quick report. Right now it's, there's quite a bit of manual work for us that's involved in identifying what what proprietary codes we need to change. So it, it's still a work in process for us. This is Bob. Um, I think that's a very fair uh, response, and uh, thank you very much. Um, we do have another question here. It's rather lengthy, so I'm just going to paraphrase it uh, for the group. And it's really related, I think, to um, how can we expand um, perhaps the potential number of business scenarios from the four that we have now to, into um, other areas that the core code combinations could consider, as well as are there additional CARPs or RARPs that should be considered and be added to the code list and therefore added to additional core code um, combinations. Um, so it's kind of a, a broadening of do we have enough codes? Do we explain all the scenarios well enough so the providers get all the details that they need? Do you want to try that? Sure, Bob, thanks. So I think this goes back again to our industry-driven market-based review process. So that's really the goal of the MBR, the, so the annual MBR, is to um, make sure that the core code combinations are keeping up with and evolving with the, any new industry business needs and meeting all of the potential scope of industry business needs. So as um, I think we mentioned earlier, we had about um, 400 submissions, individual submissions that came in. But then these submissions do have to be vetted using, we have a set of evaluation criteria that were used to create the initial four to core code combinations, the initial list published back in June 20, 2012, and then that are used by the task group to maintain the list. So um, there is a vetting process essentially that is done by the core code combination task group, which you know, is like represents the stakeholder, um, the entire industry is multi-stakeholder. And so using the 
core code, the code combinations evaluation criteria, they look at those submissions and it includes things like are we, um, is it duplicative of the message so that, you know, we're not making sure the provider is not getting the same message a hundred different ways, which leads to the same inconsistency that we had when we were, before we created the rules, the rules targeting. So um, the goal again of BMBR is to broaden the code combinations, make sure we're addressing all of the needs. We will be looking, you know, at, at new business scenarios. But at the same time, we don't want to dilute the purpose of the CHH Core 360 rule. And so it's important for the task group to um, carefully scrutinize and review the submissions. And again, in participation in the task group is open to um, the entire industry. So you can join CORE as a participating organization and get on the task group and, and contribute. And if I can actually add to that too, um, when it comes to the actual Park and Rark codes themselves, um, anyone within the industry can also make a submission to the CART Committee and Rark Committee for additional codes because you may um, have very specific reasons to um, adjudicate a claim or a claim line, you know, deny or um, adjudicate that or adjust the line. And if you don't see that particular reason within the existing CARPs and RARPs today, you can go to those committees. Um, again, they take your submissions uh, online via email uh, for new codes, and they will consider those and weigh those at their meetings that they hold um, three times per year. So we as an industry can actually have uh, quite a bit of impact on what the CARPs are, what they say, what the RARPs are and what they say, and then how the code combinations really come together to make the um, adjudication of the claim as clear and as transparent as possible for a provider so that the provider um, has the uh, knowledge they need to actually have make, make an action on the claim. Um, it can auto post, it can auto, if the claim can auto adjudicate, the payment information can auto post. So we really want to, um, uh, you know, request of the industry to become part of that process. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, I want to let you know that if you do think of a question after this webinar, um, you know how to reach us. Please uh, contact us by email, look at our website. There's some resources there that um, we have that hopefully will help you. Um, and also, if we can, I'd like to go to the next slide where we have uh, some takeaways. Um, and I'm not going to read the slides to you, um, but I think the message to leave you with is, you know, this process is helpful from surveys that we've conducted. Uh, respondents um, are, it, think this process is meaningful. Um, and again, um, please uh, come to our website and look for more information. And also, um, in the future, we will do other webinars that will hopefully meet your needs. Um, so I'm going to take this time to thank all of our speakers, especially our guest speakers from United Healthcare, and thank you as well for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, uh, please uh, take a few moments to take the survey at the end of this webinar. We do value your feedback and we use that to create new material, to create new webinars. Um, and don't forget that a recording of this session will be available at our core website within the next 24 hours. Again, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again or hear you again soon at, a, at another uh, core national webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.